Our first one comes from the epistle of James. We're going to be reading chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Hear these words of scripture. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace, stay warm, have a nice meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Someone might claim, you have faith and I have action. But how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice in faithful action. It's good that you believe that God is one. Ha! Even the demons believe this and they tremble with fear. Are you so slow? Do you need to be shown that faith without actions has no value at all? What about Abraham, our father? Wasn't he shown to be righteous through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? See, his faith was at work along with his actions. In fact, his faith was made complete by his faithful actions. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and God regarded him as righteous. What is more, Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that a person is shown to be righteous through faithful actions and not through faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute shown to be righteous when she received the messengers as her guests and then sent them on by another road? As the lifeless body is dead, so faith without actions is dead. I now would invite you to stand for our gospel reading. It comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 21. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you dressed like sheep, but inside they are vicious wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do people get bunches of grapes from thorny weeds, or do they get figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, and every rotten tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a rotten tree can't produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you will know them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And let's pray together. We thank you, God, for this beautiful Sunday morning, and we ask that as we gather, your spirit would fall on us, open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears, to hear what you have to say to us through your word in the name of Christ. Amen. One of my favorite movies of all time is The Princess Bride. How many of you like The Princess Bride? It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It uh, recently had its 30th anniversary. It was not a, a super hit when it came to the theaters, but as it's taken on a life of its own over the years, it's become part of the lexicon of our culture. There are a lot of great lines from that movie, quotable lines. I could probably quote most of it to you. Uh, that and the first Star Wars movie, I have those memorized. And um, I, lo I love to use those lines sometimes too, like when you're, you're sending people out after a staff meeting, for example, have fun storming the castle, right? Or if you have to deliver bad news, you say chocolate coating makes it go down easier. Or maybe if someone is, uh, is considering a marriage proposal, there is the, the idea of please consider me as an alternative to suicide. I love that. It's great. But the best lines in the movie are given, in my opinion, by Inigo Montoya, who is the, the Spanish swordsman played by Mandy Patinkin. He is seeking revenge on the six-fingered man who killed his father. And he practices his speech that he's going to give when he meets this man over and over again. You know the speech, right? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. But I, think, I don't even think that's the best line, though. 
I think he has another line that has stuck with me even more than that. It comes after uh, Fazzini, who is the Sicilian uh, mastermind uh, who uses words in the wrong way all the time. But he keeps saying that things are inconceivable when they are in fact conceivable. And at one point, uh, Inigo Montoya turns to Fazzini and says, he says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. And I've used that over and over again because we use words all the time assuming that everybody knows what they mean. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And that's especially the case when it comes to understanding the scriptures. Words like gospel, grace, faith, salvation. We assume that we know what we mean when we use those words. Preachers assume that, right? My friend Matt Burnett's here this morning, Pastor Holy Trinity Trinity Anglican. We go to each other's churches when we have Sundays off, so it's kind of cool to have him here this morning. And um, we, we use these words and we assume that people know what we're talking about, that we're all on, on pace. It's a conundrum, It's the Inigo Montoya conundrum. It shows up controversially, and it shows up most controversially here in the second chapter of James, which has been a a point of contention ever since the Protestant Reformation. About 500 years ago, Martin Luther, of course, launches the the Protestant Reformation. But as he looked through the scriptures, he looked at the, the epistle of James, and he called it an epistle of straw. Why? Because it didn't fully flesh out or match his idea about salvation by faith alone. Remember that the Reformation pushed the theological pendulum all the way away from Roman Catholicism, which it's with its many works like penance and, and sacraments and the selling of indulgences. And so Luther wanted to make sure that there was no sense of works being involved in the idea of salvation by faith. Luther read James through a Reformation lens, and he saw it as being inadequate, an inadequate expression of the gospel, lesser than the writings of Paul. And subsequent generations of Protestants have read Luther's emphasis into James, prioritizing faith over any kind of works at all. But this is a case where definition of terms makes all the difference, We have to define how James uses some of these words, how Scripture uses them. And when we do that, we begin to see more clearly and understand James within the larger context of the whole story of Scripture. So I'm going to define some of these words this morning and uh, see how James uses them in a powerful way. The first word I want to look at is the word gospel. Now, James doesn't use that word. He uses the word, word, to describe it. Chapter 1, verse 18. Remember, God's purpose was to give us birth through the true word. And the result, James says, is that we are like the first crop of the harvest of everything that God created. Chapter 1, verse 21. It's this word that is planted deep inside you. The very word, says James, that is able to save you. That's gospel. Gospel has many definitions. When I say that, people automatically run to those different definitions. For some people, gospel is the means by which we get to heaven when we die. For others, gospel is a social justice program. And still for others, it's a form of music sung by the Gaither brothers, right? That's, that's, we look at it in different ways. We use that word, but we doesn't, it doesn't always mean what we think it means. For James, as for Jesus, and I would argue as for Paul and all the other New Testament writers, the gospel is the story of the whole Bible, Old and New Testaments, which reaches its climax in Jesus Christ. Remember what we say in the Creed. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. In other words, the gospel sees Jesus as both the means and the model for true humanity. He represents God and humanity fully, fully human, 
fully divine. He takes on sin and death in person. He defeats them on the cross and through his resurrection and sets us free for the abundant life we were created for both now and in the future. So eternal destiny is part of the gospel, but it's not the sum total of the gospel. It's not its focus and primary purpose. Remember what James says, the gospel enables us to pursue righteousness. What did we say righteousness was? You remember? Being conformed to the image of God. To live that life conformed to the image of God. And so we miss the full impact when we make the gospel into a shorthand systematic theology or into a social program. Because the gospel is the controlling story. The story of God becoming like us so that we might become like him. To see his image restored in us. Salvation then is more than a get out of hell free card. It's the result of the gospel. It's a through-going project that transforms people and transforms God's good creation. It's not merely a ticket to heavenly bliss, but it's an active transformational work in our lives. We're not just saved from sin and death, we are saved for God's purposes. As my friend J.D. Walt says, and J.D. wrote the devotional that we're using for this series, he said, the best of the gospel is the rest of the gospel, the whole gospel. And all of this is at God's initiative, that initiative we call grace. Grace is a gift, but it's a gift that is given for a purpose. It's given to change us. God loves us as we are, but he loves us enough to not leave us that way. He loves us into being the people he created us to be. And so then we turn to the word faith, which is our response to the gospel and God's offer of salvation. Faith here is not merely intellectual or spiritual. It's a response that involves every aspect of our lives. It's belief and trust that leads to receiving the grace that transforms us into the image of God. This is very Wesleyan. The idea of grace being transformational. That God comes to us and moves us further toward him. And that means also living the vocation for which we were created from the very beginning. That vocation involves the work that God gave to humanity, stewardship, and worship, and care for others, and for God's good creation. We were created for purpose. So when we define these terms in this way, James' teaching then comes into clearer focus. It's not an epistle of straw, but a practical application of the gospel and our resulting vocation. Paul and James are talking about the same things. They're just emphasizing different aspects of it. If Paul is focused on the theology of the gospel, James is focused on the response. He never suggests that we do anything to earn God's grace. But once we have received it, it must necessarily transform our lives or it isn't faith at all. Verse 14, chapter 2, James says this, My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? This is James Inigo Montoya moment. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Faith. He's challenging those who would define faith apart from vocation. Verses 15 and 16, he gives an example. Imagine you come upon someone who's hungry, who's in need of food, who's in need to say, be blessed, go on your way, but you don't serve them. What good is that, says James? You haven't put the faith into action. Remember what he said in chapter 1, verse 27, about true religion. What is true religion? Caring for widows and orphans in their distress and remaining unstained by the world. This is echoing his brother Jesus. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, that famous passage where Jesus says, if you, if you feed someone, if you, if you give them clothing, if you give them a drink, it's like you're doing it to me. If you fail to do that, you won't get into the kingdom. Many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, 
but will not enter the kingdom because he'll say, I never knew you because you didn't treat me in this way. There's an active component to our faith. Serving others serves him. Failure results in judgment. Real faith for James and for Jesus is embodied, otherwise it is dead. Faith, in other words, is evidenced by fruit. Jesus uses this imagery often. John 15, we looked at John, remember, all the way through the spring, and that famous passage of John 15 about the vine and the branches. Jesus says, my father is glorified when you produce much fruit, and in this way prove that you are my disciples. Prove that you are my disciples. Unfruitful branches, on the other hand, are removed, thrown into the fire. Matthew 7, which we read earlier, Kent read it for us. The difference between true and false followers of Jesus, true and false prophets. What's the difference? The fruit that they produce. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus. Only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Real faith produces real evidence. James says, chapter 2, verse 18, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice in faithful action. In fact, there's really no other way to prove our faith. And you say, wait a minute, Pastor Bob, doesn't having my doctrine right prove that I'm a a faithful person? Well, yes, that's an essential part of this as well. You can't separate the two things. But here's the thing, and James makes this clear in the next section, verse 20. He says, right belief alone puts you in the company of demons because they believe. They know the systematic theology. They know who God is. And they fear and they tremble. But that's as far as it goes. They're not producing fruit. And they fear because they know because they don't produce it, they will be judged eternally. In other words, says James, don't be as dumb as a demon. If you get nothing else out of today, grab onto that. Don't be as dumb as a demon. Faith without action is dead. And James then offers two examples from the scripture. He takes us back to the story of Abraham, all the way back to Genesis 22. Remember, he's writing to a largely Jewish audience. They would know the story, the story of the binding of Isaac, where God tells Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, the one you've waited for, the one that you had in your old age, the one you had, as Paul says, when you were so old as to be as good as dead, and I want you to take him up on the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him before me. And Abraham is faithful. He does, he takes his son to the top of the mountain. It's a horrific story for those of us in the 21st century. We look at that and go, how can that possibly be? But maybe that's because we see most tests of faith as hypothetical. When it comes down to it, do we really trust God enough to do what he says, even if it doesn't make sense at the time? James says that Abraham was willing because he trusted God's purpose So, James says, his faith was at work along with his actions. In fact, his faith was made complete, verse 22, by his faithful actions. And so the result was that Abraham was regarded as righteous, conforming to God's image, and was called God's friend. Now, of course, we know the story that Abraham doesn't actually sacrifice his son. He lifts the knife, God stops him, and and provides a, a substitute. And we look at that story and we say, wow, what, what must it have been like for Abraham to, to lift the knife over his beloved son? I remember when I was a kid, you know, we were doing like a vacation Bible school thing and, and we, had to, we had to act this out. And I was, I was Isaac and my dad was Abraham and, uh, and he had a rubber knife over, my, over me doing that. And I thought to myself, this is crazy, <laughs> right? Th- this, is, this is nuts, Now, we sacrifice our kids all the time in this culture. But remember that this is a foreshadowing story. Because when the time comes for the ultimate sacrifice, God does not withhold his own son. He goes to the cross 
for us. Jesus chose obedience by faith in going to the cross. His salvation that he offers to us is an act of faithfulness on the part of Christ. Remember what he says in the garden, not my will, but yours. Faith will walk toward death if that's what it takes. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says, this is the way of discipleship. All who want to come after me must say no to themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's the first example. And then Abraham gives a second example of faith from the Old Testament. Kind of a curious one, Rahab. Remember the story of Rahab? She's a prostitute in Jericho. The spies come from the Israelites, cross the River Jordan, come into Jericho, and uh, they're hiding out, and Rahab hides them, makes sure they get out of the city okay. And so when, when Joshua and the Israelites come to destroy Jericho, she and her family are saved. And, and that's an interesting choice because here is a, a pagan woman who, who doesn't yet have her doctrine right, and yet she knows something big is about to happen, she demonstrates faith even before she knew God personally. Her conversion, as we might put it, was already in process. And I think that's true because after doing the word, the hearing becomes the easy part. James concludes all of this with a summary statement. Verse 26, as the lifeless body is dead, so faith without action is dead. When we fail to act on our faith, we present a dead witness to the world. And if we go back to Martin Luther, I would argue, as uh, historian Brad Gregory argues, that one of the unintended byproducts of the Reformation is that we became so enamored with studying the Bible and doctrine that faith became less about living and more about thinking. Now, doctrine is vital. You know me. I love to preach it. It's essential to what we do here. We are a confessional church. We say the creed on Sunday. We say what we believe. Doctrine is absolutely essential. But in itself, it is not sufficient. We must demonstrate how faith works. We must define it in terms of living out what it means. The gospel is a living faith, and it requires a response an individual response, and a collective response. See, in, in Christian faith, there's no separation between individual and, and social. It's God's through-going project. It's about transforming the whole world. We're part of a collective movement of God. E. Stanley Jones, the great mes- Methodist missionary, put it this way, a personal gospel without a social gospel is a soul without a body. And a social gospel without a personal gospel is a body without a soul. One is a ghost, the other a corpse. The point is that both are dead. Dead because it's not lived. We have to do more than simply convert people to have the same level of faith and knowledge as demons do. The faith of a disciple goes to work. It takes on God's vocation. It's a transformation of the whole life. We do the work that God has prepared us for do. Remember what James says earlier, be not just hearers of the word, but be doers also. Paul says essentially the same thing in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. I remember memorizing verses 8 and 9 as a kid. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we cut it off there, but we forget verse 10, which is essential. What does it say? For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which he prepared beforehand for us to do from the very beginning. We are saved by grace through faith, absolutely but we are saved for the work of God. Each of us has a part of that work. We are a vocational people made in God's image for God's purpose. 
And so we need to keep using the words, gospel, faith, works, but we must live them out so that others know what they mean in practice. I love the old question, and I think about this often. I was I learned this as a kid. Here's the question. If you were accused of being a follower of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a great question. I mean, I went to Sunday school. I, I, I showed up in church when, when I could, and uh, I, 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 I said the right words, but is there an, enough evidence? As my old Sunday school teacher, Mrs. M, used to say, sitting in church doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. You can have church attendance, you can have perfect pins, you can have Sunday school knowledge, but did it change your life? Do you live differently because of your encounter with Jesus Christ, because of your faith in Him? And it's important because the world is watching, particularly now. In the early church, evangelism was as much about the way of life as it was about the message. That's how we gain a hearing in this world. They'll know we are Christians by our confession. They'll know we are Christians by our love. They'll know it by the way we demonstrate the family resemblance we have in Jesus Christ, as we said last week. So we need to live in such a way that we gain a hearing. We, we need to live in such a way that we can walk up to someone and in our best Inigo Montoya accent, say, Hello. My name is... Insert your name here. You were made in the image of God. Prepare to live. Prepare to live. And this is how we do it. May it be so with us. May we be doers of the word not just hearers. May we put our faith into action so that it is a living faith that can help transform the world for God's kingdom. Let us pray. Lord, we, we hear James' word and it is powerfully convicting for us because we recognize that there are lots of times when we, we have our faith all systematized but we don't always live it out. We keep it at arm's length. But you call us, Lord, to an active faith, a sacrificial life, one that is willing to give even to the point of death. Grant us courage, Lord, to be faithful people who live what we believe. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.